Hi, I'm Rowan Miller. I'm a program manager on the Entity Framework team here at Microsoft. Let's talk about Entity Framework 5. The last few versions of Entity Framework have shipped on NuGet in between releases of Visual Studio. EF5 is going to ship on NuGet, but it's also included in the box with Visual Studio 2012. I'm going to talk about some of the things that are new in EF5, and then I'm going to demo some of them to you. In EF5, we have new Enum support. This is something you guys have been asking for for a long time now. We also have support for spatial data types. These allow you to work with geographic and geometric data in your applications. If you have an existing database that has table value functions, or TVFs for short in them, you can now map to those using the Entity Framework Designer. The Entity Framework Designer in Visual Studio 2012 now supports multiple diagrams. This allows you to split a large model up into subsections. In addition to that, we have a new UI to match the look and feel of Visual Studio. Along with all these new features, we have some great performance improvements for you. We've had some good benchmarks, but a better showcase of the performance improvements is an end-to-end -end application we run in our test suite here that saw a 67% performance increase just by upgrading to EF5. Code First has been around for some time now, but this is the first time that it's been included in the box with Visual Studio. With Code First and the EF Designer, you now have two ways to build your models. You can either use pure code with Code First or boxes and lines in the Designer with the Entity Framework Designer. Both of these workflows are equally valid, and the one that you pick just depends on your preference as a developer. Both of these workflows can already map to an existing database, or you can create your model and have the database generated for you. This is also the first time the DB Context API has been in the box with Visual Studio. The DB Context API is a simplified and more efficient API surface. If you create a new model with the Entity Framework Designer, you will get the DB Context API by default. Existing models will continue to use object context unless you explicitly opt in to the new DB Context API. So that's what's coming. Let's take a look at some of this in action. I'm going to write an application that allows users to find a local park, somewhere they can go and enjoy some recreation or a bit of time with their family. To do this, we're going to make use of Code First, the DB Context API, the new support for spatial data, and in addition to that, we're going to see how Entity Framework integrates with some of the technologies that also ship inside Visual Studio. Let's hop over to Visual Studio, and I'm going to create a new project. We're going to create an MVC application, and I'm going to select the Web API template. Web API is a great way to create database services that expose data to a variety of different platforms, be that desktop, phone, or the web. The first thing I'm going to do is create a code first model. I'm going to add a class to my project, and I'm going to drag in a model that I've already created. The great thing about a code first model is that it's just your classes, and these classes don't have any dependencies on Entity Framework. Looking at the model I've created here, you can see it's made up of a park and the events that are going to be held in that park. You'll also notice that the park class has a location property, which is the type DB geography. This is the new spatial data types that are introduced in .NET 4.5. I'm just going to resolve the system.data.spatial namespace for that type. Now that we've built our model, let's build the application and go ahead and add a web API controller. I'm going to call this one the parks controller. And we're going to select the template that will scaffold read-write code that uses Entity Framework. I'm going to select the Park class to scaffold this controller for. And our data context represents the session with the database. We haven't created a context yet, so I'm going to let the scaffolding create a new one for me called the Parks context. When I hit Add, the scaffolding is going to look at the shape of my model, and it's going to generate an API controller and the context for me. When I look at the code it's generated, I can see the API controller creates an instance of the parks context and then has some methods here to perform query, insert, update, and delete functionality. So far, the only ability we have to get parks is to get a list of all parks or to get the park that has a particular ID. I'm going to drag in a new method here that allows us to get the parks closest to a given GPS coordinate. This method starts by creating a DB geography instance based on the coordinates that were passed in. It then uses a link query to select all parks that are within 10 kilometers of the given coordinate. That list of parks is then returned to the user. 
Let's write some code to consume this web API. I'm going to go to the Views folder and open up the index view that is launched when our application opens. I'm going to delete all of the code out of there and drag in some new code. I'll walk you through this code now. As far as UI goes, we have a single text box that prompts a user for their current location. This could be a street address or a city or anything else the user might type in. When they hit the search button, it launches a set of JavaScript functions. The first one it launches is the search function. This uses the Bing Maps location API to turn that text that the user provided into a GPS coordinate. Once we have that, we obtain the coordinates from the result and then load up a Bing map centered on those locations. Finally, we call a load parks method, which queries our web API and gets a list of all parks within 10 kilometers of the center of the map. Once those results are returned, the add park pin function is called for each park so that a pin is dropped on the map. Let's go ahead and run and see what happens. When our application launches, I'm going to go ahead and enter Seattle as my location. When I hit the search button, as expected, the map is centered on Seattle, but there aren't any parks to display. That's because there's no data in our database. In fact, we didn't even create a database. So let's see what CodeFirst has done. Because we didn't tell CodeFirst to map to an existing database, it's gone ahead and created a database for us. If I look at my local DB instance and refresh the databases, I'll see a new parks context database here. Looking at the tables in here, I'll see that CodeFirst has created tables for my model. It's used a set of conventions to determine what the database should look like. Rest assured, there's plenty of opportunity within CodeFirst to customize what the database actually looks like. We have an empty database at the moment. Let's look at creating some seed data. To do that, I'm going to enable something called CodeFirst Migrations. To do that, in Package Manager Console, I'm going to run the Enable Migrations command. Doing this will add two things to my project in the Migrations folder. If I look over there, I'll see an initial create migration. This represents the changes that have already been applied to the database. Here you can see some create statements for the parks and events table. The other thing it added is a configuration class. This is where I configure the settings for migrations. One of the things I can do here is specify some seed data. I'm going to take out the commented code and drag in some seed data that I wrote earlier. Looking at the code, I can see that we're using the add or update method from CodeFirst Migrations to insert a whole bunch of parks in the database. I'm just going to resolve the namespaces. With this done, I can use the update database command in Package Manager Console to go ahead and apply these changes to the database. With that done, let's go ahead and run our application again. And again, I'm going to enter Seattle as my current location and click Search. The map will center on Seattle, but this time it loads a bunch of parks from the database. If I click on one of these, I can see that it's also displaying the name from the database. Now that we've seen how to create an application that uses a code-first model and how to insert seed data, let's look at how we change the database when our model changes. To do this, I'm going to open up the model again and I'm going to add a rating property to the park. If I ran my application now, I would get an exception because CodeFirst would tell me that the model no longer matches the schema in the database. From Package Manager Console, I'm going to use the add migration command, and I get to give migrations a name. I'm going to call this one add rating. When I run that command, CodeFirst migrations will look at the model the last time the migration was created and look at the model now and work out the changes. It's calculated that I just need to add a rating column to the parks table. I could edit this code now, but it looks pretty good for our situation. So let's go ahead and run update database. Update database will see that I have a new pending migration in my project and apply it to the database. If I open up my database again and refresh the columns on the parks table, I'll see that the new rating column is present. So that's been a demo of some of the features coming in EF5. There's obviously a lot more. If you want to see that, head to msdn.com slash data slash EF for a whole bunch of walkthroughs, videos, and other great information. Thank you.